Morning, guys. How's it going? Um, hello from afar or virtually. Um, I know this is weird, but I guess we all have to get used to it for some time. Uh, my name is Donovan. I'm a graduate fellow here at Rockefeller University, um, which is in the Upper East Side in New York. Um, I hope you guys are warm and cozy at home because the, the walk for me, even though it's 50 degrees outside, I felt it was a bit cold. <laughs> um, a little background about me. Um, I'm a graduate student. Um, originally from Singapore, I was born and raised in Singapore, but then I moved to California to do my um, K through 12 education. And then I went to um, undergrad in Seattle. Um, so I, stayed, I spent most of my time on the West Coast and I don't want to get into any arguments saying it's the best coast, but um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and before I get, really get started, I just want to kind of get a sense of everyone. That if you, I know we don't. I know everyone's um, going to have to chat with me virtually, or you know, you're welcome to use your mic or um, camera if you want. But just to get a sense of everyone's here, um, give me just type in a one if you're a summer person or a two if you're a winter person. Okay, I see a lot of okay. Oh, yeah, winter person. Half, yeah, halfway, all winter. Actually, this is a half summer, half winter, which makes sense. Which makes sense. I can see that. I guess in in New York. Okay, you play hockey, yeah. Um, coming from California, I'm a summer person. I don't care if it's humid or muggy. I like it. I, I just like it. I like the hot sun, you know. So, um, well, at least this winter, you get to enjoy the um, seasons inside. <laughs> all right. So today I'll be talking to you guys a little bit about um, PCR or polymerase chain reaction, something that um, some, as a research scientist, almost all of us do all the time, whether we like it or we not. <laughs> um, and it's actually super applicable in all, all sorts of ways. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit at the end. So what is PCR? Well, I'll start off with um, DNA, right? So DNA is the genetic material that basically encodes everything um, that is necessary to make a living organism, right? From bacteria to us humans. Um, and every time we divide, we have to also divide and replicate our DNA. And it turns out that um, we're able to take advantage of this system, this, this ability to replicate our DNA um, and actually use it for uh, genetic engineering purposes or to study specific genes of interest um, within your, within your um, chromosome. And this was developed in the 80s and something now that we've been doing for, for decades, right? And, um, and now it's, for back then it used to be, you know, something that everyone spent hours and hours upon and now it's like the back of our hands, how we can do PCR. So what is PCR? Okay, I'm gonna just, oh my, I guess my, my screen is backwards, so I apologize. But PCR would be polymerase, I'm gonna read out loud, polymerase chain reaction, okay? Polymerase chain reaction. So, Maybe we can break down these words together, even though it's backwards. Polymerase. You can break down the word polymerase into uh, basically two sections, po polymer and ace. So what is a polymer? It's only backwards for you. Oh, okay, perfect. Well, I'm, I'm glad. Um, so what is, what, is, what is a polymer, right? Anyone want to give me a guess for what polymer is? You guys can Google it if you guys really want, but I have a, I have a hunch you guys know it because you guys are smart AP biology students. No, yes, no, maybe so. I can give you guys a hint. Formed by monomers, yeah. Uh, combination monomers. Yeah, combination of monomers, yeah. So a polymer is, is basically um, a molecule that is made out of, of repetitive units, right? And yeah, chain of macromolecules, long repeating chains of molecules. That's great. And you guys are right. A polymer is exactly that, which is exactly our DNA. An ACE. What is an ACE? Maybe you guys heard a lot of, hear a lot of it in, in biology uh, or, or chemistry. And you, and you have an enzyme. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, um, Chasian. Enzyme, an ACE. So an ACE is, a, is an enzyme. So you think about polymerase, which is um, an enzyme that's going to work on the polymer. Right, it happens to be this polymer is going to be the, the uh, your DNA. It's an enzyme that works in your DNA. There are many types of enzymes, um, from like amylase, the enzyme that makes the pretzels taste sweet in your mouth, right, um, and so forth. And then chain reaction. So chain reaction um, is very intuitive, but for a polymerase chain reaction, what happens is you're taking your 
enzyme that is working on the DNA, the polymerase, and you're going to let it react on the DNA over and over again, a chain reaction, almost like as if you tip a, a domino over um, a chain of dominoes and they all fall in line, right? And that's basically what uh, uh, PCR is. It's, it's, it's a chain reaction of, of, of your DNA over and over again to basically um, make more of a, of a gene of interest or make more of a DNA sequence of interest. So this, is, this might not make a lot of sense by just describing it. So I'll give you a quick picture and then I'll show you guys how it works. So for PCR, how it works, um, how, there's three steps, all right? And, and, and in my high school, we learned this like horrible song and I'm not gonna teach you guys it because I, I myself cannot get it out of my head. But um, how it works for PCR is you have a DNA of interest, right? And um, let's say it could be a DNA that's super long or it could be super short. Um, and basically you have a, you have something within the DNA that you're really, really interested in. Um, but only having one or two copies of this DNA is not enough. And that's why you use PCR to rep, to make maybe 5,000 or 10,000 copies of this DNA. So you can see more of it. Um, and basically what happens is you have your DNA and a little short fragment. I don't know if you can see this little pink. We're going to call this a primer basically a short fragment that resembles just part of the DNA, but not the whole thing. And that's something you can actually um, chemically synthesize or buy from a company, and it's very, very cheap to make small things like this. And what you're going to do first is you're going to denature. So denaturing your, your DNA fragment and how we denature it. Well, let me ask you this. Um, DNA, let's see, this, this may be a, a, a pop question, uh, pop quiz question. DNA is how is, how is DNA kept together? This may be a chemistry question, but let's see who can pick that up. How, how is DNA, how are the two strands of DNA bound together? And you guys can guess, any guess you want. Bond, hydrogen bonds, Layla, perfect, hydrogen bonds. Wow, this is faster than how I used to raise my hand in class, so I feel like I'm getting outsmarted here. Um, so hydrogen bonds, right. So DNA is, is bound by hydrogen bonds, and hydrogen bonds are these super high energy bonds um, that take a lot of work to actually uh, break apart. And so to denature, to you, what you actually want to do is you want to denature your DNA, which is basically putting really high energy or heating it up really high to separate the two strands of DNA. Meanwhile, you had this little primer guy, this little pink guy, just hanging out. Next step is what you would do is that you would anneal your DNA. So you would anneal your primer to your uh, to one of the strands of the DNA, right? And that way they're basically matching. So instead of matching with the original piece, which are matching, you can you can match with the smaller piece because the smaller piece will um, always be more likely to bind than the longer piece. And then you extend. This is where you take use of the polymerase that we talked about. The polymerase is this large machine that basically will bind to a double-stranded piece of DNA. And in this case, because we have a primer that you annealed it to, um, it will bind to this double-stranded DNA, right? This just a just short fragment and then extend along this, this leftover piece and fill it in, right? And then you repeat, you go back up, you break it apart, and then you repeat over and over again. And by doing this, you actually um, create more and more of the same fragment that you're building right here. And you get more and more and more DNA, all right? And once you get more and more DNA of this, of this specific uh, fragment of interest, you can actually start using it for all sorts of things, whether it's for like um, studies, or, or even like lab tests. So rather than talk at you all day long, um, I'm gonna just show you guys how all of it works, yeah? And I can give you guys a tour of the lab while I'm walking there to it. So I'm gonna use my camera, and what should happen is I'm gonna switch from my phone to my, um, or my camera to my phone. Cool. Oh, sorry, sorry. I apologize. Okay. Can you see? Okay, you guys can see me. Okay, you guys can see me. Cool. All right. So I'm gonna guys. I'm gonna show you how PCR works, and this is my crib. Welcome to MTV, my crib, um, my bench and where most of the things happen. But I'll show you guys what happens in the PCR reaction. So 
PCRs usually happen, and you guys can still hear me, right? Yeah, you guys can still hear me. So PCRs usually happen in these small little tubes. I don't know if you can see it, but they're as tiny as it gets. They're, you know, they're smaller than my hand. And in these little tubes, you can see that there's the bits of liquid. And right now they're frozen, but I have some pre-made already for you guys um, that basically uh, are PCR reactions. And this can go through. Um, this is how a PCR, um, this is how a, a, a PCR uh, looks like or on a PCR machine. It's a big machine that can fit these little tubes in and we can do exactly what we talked about. Denature, extend, or denature, anneal, and extend. So at high temperatures, you can denature something. And at lower temperatures, when you cool it down, your small little fragment will anneal to the, to the main DNA. And then you can extend for a long time. That's where the polymerase will keep going along the DNA to make more of it. And then you repeat times 35. Repeat. And then once you're done, you're good to go. And actually, it's nice that we have a machine like this, but in the 80s and 90s, they would have a poor student that would actually um, that would actually stand there in the water or stand there with like three different buckets of water at different temperatures going back and forth. And that would be their entire PhD. Now it's you know done with within two hours or three hours by machine. So it's pretty nice. So now let me get a chance to show you guys um, the, the, the reaction itself and how we can actually visualize it. So here is a reaction I've already made. I dyed it blue so I can actually show it to you guys on the gel. And then we're going to run it on a gel uh, on a gel to actually see what it looks like. And it's called gel electrophoresis. All right. Um, I'm going to grab the gel real quick. And I'll be right back. It'll take me like one second. Okay, I'll be right back. So this is a DNA gel. As you can see, it's solid, it's squishy. And I'm gonna take it out. Here's where I'll try to switch my camera and see if this will work upside down. You guys see? All right, you guys can see all this, cool. So this is the machine that I talked about, and I'll go over what this machine is in a bit, but I'll show you guys how, how we can run our, run our sample on a DNA gel and actually visualize the DNA that you made. And actually, this is something that I need for my own experiment, so you guys can actually see something happen in real time and something that I care about. Um, so we can take our sample, you can see here, I can pipette it. Put it into these wells. Did you guys see that? Do you guys see these little wells here? Could you guys see these little like, like light indentations? That's actually where the liquid for your DNA or your um, or your DNA goes in. That's how it fits into the gel. And I'll explain how the gel works in a bit. Um, and that would make a lot more sense. So I have two samples. I'm just gonna throw one in, and then. As always, I'm going to add a ruler, and I'll explain a ruler in just a second. All right. And what I'm doing now, actually, is I'm setting up the machine to run the gel, um, to basically run electricity to it. But I'll go over what gel electrophoresis is in just a second, OK? OK, cool. And it's not going to run that long, but we'll just have it running for a while. All right, so I'm going to switch back. All right, so while it's running, and I'll show you guys the gel in a bit, I'll just go over what gel electrophoresis is. Oh. Okay. Mute myself. Yeah, gel electrophoresis is. Um, gel electrophoresis, which is a very long name, it sounds like a mouthful, uh, basically is the idea that you can run um, something through a gel using electricity, all right? And this is useful because you can actually sort things based on their um, electric charge, all right? And so let me ask you guys this. Uh, is DNA negatively or positively charged? 
anyone knows, this, this may be a little bit of negative. Yeah, yes, Winnie, thank you, negatively charged, yeah. And um, because DNA is negatively charged, um, you guys can see that um, it will actually run electricity from this way down this way. So from positive down to, or sorry, yeah, from positive down to, sorry, negative down to positive, right? I think it's negative to positive. Um, yeah, and basically how it works is that, sorry, I was wrong. It's, it, should be, it should be negative to positive. I don't know why I said that. It should be negative to positive. Um, negative to positive, and um, how, how it works is that you have electricity running from the negative electrode down to the positive electrode, right? And since you said, since when you said that uh, DNA is negative, um, basically, you're going to be able to sort your DNA by size, by um, how negatively charged it is um, as the DNA gel runs across. And here you see how it's running down slowly. It used to be like up there, and now it's a little bit for lower down, right? You guys can see that. All right, so while it's running, let me ask you this. Um, for negative, if, if, um, for a gel like this, where will the largest bands show up? The largest, if it might be, if I, let's say, have multiple, multiple sizes of DNA, would the larger DNA show up higher or lower on this gel? If I had a larger piece of DNA and I was running it on the gel, and this is uh, sorting by by from negative to positive, sorting by electrical charge, where do you guys you guys can guess too? Where do you guys think the the DNA is going to be? Um, the larger the DNA, the higher or the lower the gel? Okay, you got some lower the gel. Layla thinks it's lower the gel. Chow thinks it's, it's higher than the higher. And you guys, everyone can guess. It's okay. You don't have to have a right answer. Higher, lower, higher, lower, higher, lower. Lower, okay, lower, lower. All right, cool, we can go over this again. Yeah, yeah, nice nice guesses, everyone. Um, and I actually wanna tell you, and maybe you guys can guess, what, guess, guess why in your mind. It actually turns out, you will see later, that the DNA actually is going, the larger your DNA, the higher it is gonna be in the gel. And that's because we talked about how it's running, uh, going from negative to positive, right? And you're running electricity through it. And so if your DNA gel, DNA is larger, if it's much larger of a DNA, it means it's going to be more negatively charged than the smaller pieces of DNA. And if it's more negatively charged, it's going to have a lot harder time having to move its butt over to the positive side. All right? So it's going to drag itself and take a lot longer to go through. While, while smaller pieces of DNA, because it's um, less negatively charged, um, it's going to move much faster down the gel. You guys can actually be able to see this. So I'm going to put this over here. So I'm not going to blind everyone. Turn off the lights. You guys should be able to see how bands are moving along the gel. Do you guys see that? It's actually fluorescent. Um, you can see how there's like, um, there's like what you saw the blue dye was, but right below the blue dye, you can actually see these bands. And actually, you know what you're seeing, actually, it's pretty cool. It's over time, you're seeing this whole, all these bands separate. And it's gonna take some time, and I'll just kind of let it sit here. Um, you can see how it's separating over time, really, really slowly. This feels like a slow-mo video, but this is just in real life. Um, and that's kind of how gel electrophoresis works. And this is really important for PCR, because while I can see everything happen in the tube, uh, or while I can make everything happen in the tube, I don't actually know what's inside until I actually do the, do the reaction, right? And you can actually see it go slowly and slowly and slowly. And that's basically how it goes. Um, and I'm going to just quickly do one last thing to show you guys what the end result is. And so I'm going to show you guys. This will take roughly 20 minutes. But rather than let you guys sit there and wait for 20 minutes, I can actually show you guys what the end result is. So give me a second. And this is what an end result would look like, all right? And just like you guys talked about, this lower band is probably smaller than the upper band up there. And now you can tell, okay, well, look, I made I made this fragment, of, I made this, this little segment of interest, and now I can take it out to use it for further studies or for other stuff, whatever you guys want, right? And so you can see, this is like, I feel like a cooking show over here. This is my before and this is my after, all right? It's something I ran for 20 minutes already. Actually, you can even see here, it's already starting to separate. You can actually see two bands already, right? 
Um, so that's basically how PCR works, how we can visualize PCR in lab using um, gel electrophoresis and this cool little box. Actually, this blue box is to filter out the blue light. If I didn't have it, you'd be blinded by it. Actually, I'm blinded by it right now, so I'm not going to do that to myself. Um, but yeah, that's it. Oh, there's two faces of me. Let's not do that. Um, and that's basically how uh, gel electrophoresis works and PCR. Let me take off my gloves and move back to my bench. Actually, I'll let this run so you can see it happen while it's going. Um, and I'll come back and talk here a little bit more. Um, does anyone have any quick questions? You guys are always welcome to inter interject and, and ask something as it goes. But that's something that we do in the lab all the time um, to do PCRs and seeing if you know we're able to clone out, take out a, a specific gene of interest out of the out of our um, out of a, out of the genome of a cell. Insulin. Insulin is a protein that is, is this the only way to separate DNA? Um, gel, you mean gel electrophoresis? Uh, gel electrophoresis is not the only way to separate DNA. Um, you can actually separate DNA um, through like columns as well, which is similar to a gel. Um, and I don't, I don't want to get too much into it, but basically you can sort, you can also sort something similar through a, rather than a gel, you can sort it through um, a big column that acts like a gel, I guess. Um, that's one way of separating DNA, um, and that's also useful if you want it to be all in liquid rather than that thing. Is, is, this is a solid gel, so later on, if I actually want to take out the DNA, to cut the gel out and purify that. So yeah, um, but this is really useful for um, genetic engineering, for example. So one of the one of the really important genes in our in, in our cells is insulin, our ability to create insulin and regulate our sugar levels, um, and turns out that you know for people who have diabetes um, they actually need insulin I think diabetes uh, diabetes one uh, you actually need insulin or diabetes two correct me if I'm wrong um, but you actually need insulin given yeah yeah I'm gonna get to that in a second you actually need insulin given to you um, from 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 medical sources and people can actually gen people have spent a lot of time engineering taking out the insulin gene from our cells and then growing it in large E. coli large bacteria cultures and purifying that protein out and that's the insulin that we take or that diabetics take um, daily. So that's one way, of, that's one application of PCR that's really important. Um, perhaps the one that is most important and on everyone's mind right now is, is COVID testing. Yeah, this is, this is basically a simplified version of how we, how we look at or how, how they do, do the COVID-19 um, RNA or PCR analysis and checking whether or not you're positive for the COVID-19 RNA or not. So in this case, in that, in that case, and I'm going to talk about just for a little bit, in that case, they use RNA instead of DNA, but all the methods are still very similar and, and so forth. So the boogers that they pick out of your nose at the end, they're checking what for not for, for whether they can see those trace amounts of, of, of COVID-19 RNA using PCR. Um, oh, the gel light turned off, but it's okay. Um, can you use this to check if two person are related, like matching DNA? Yeah, so... Um, you can, and uh, this is so like, yes, you, you can. So um, so you guys have heard of 23andMe, right? 23andMe and like all the other like sort of, or th that's pro perhaps the most like modern or or like less medically related, um, you know, sequencing things people talk about. But yeah, they basically use a similar method to, to PC. To, they use, use a, a, a modified version of PCR to basically um, read the, the DNA sequence, um, actually using a very um, using using basically PCR to read the DNA sequence, um, and for people to check if they're related, you can um, basically pull out a fragment. If you think there's a fragment that only those two are related with, let's say a mutation or something, you can use that to check for DNA. Um, can you use this to date something? Can I use this to date something? Um, you know, you can actually use it for evolution. So people, a lot of people who, who want to study how like organisms evolve or like the, the, the evolution of a certain gene, for example, um, they can look at, well, um, this, you know, they can see how, the, how individual amino acids or individual base pairs mutate over each 
each organism over the years or, or, or each over each organism to see um, the evolution timeline. Um, you can use this to date something. However, um, I will say that like um, older, so a lot of people try to look at the, the DNA of like dinosaurs and all that junk. Um, old, the older your, your DNA, like the old, let's say it's a dinosaur, like as ancient as it gets, your, the DNA gets more and more fragmented and it becomes a lot harder to actually um, PCR something that is of like, um, of any, any, any intellectual like worth. Um, and asked me, can we use clone a species through genetic engineering? Um, yeah, so cloning a whole species means you have to clone the entire genome, right? Um, and I will say that people have, I don't think they did it by, I'm not sure they did it by PCR, but people have generated their own, like, suit, like they made their own genome basically out of using a bunch of different, or I think using yeast, um, like, you know, baker's yeast or whatever um, to cr create their own, like, genome and that is basically um one way of doing it but i don't think anyone has used it to clone an entire species um just for for pcr um yeah why is dna heated to 94 degrees i don't remember but around a temperature right right all right so we're gonna go back to yeah why why do we have to in the in the first step of of of, of pcr where i denature denature the dna and then anneal and then extend why do i have to heat it to 94 degrees which sounds like it's blazing hot so remember when I asked you guys um, how DNA was bonded, and you guys and you guys were all really smart and said hydrogen bonds. Well, it turns out if you, um, if 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 you guys kind of remember from chemistry, hydrogen bonds are one of the strongest like um, biomolecular bonds, um, and it takes a lot of energy to break something like a hydrogen bond. Um, and so um, you have to heat it to very high temperatures to break that bond apart. Yeah, covalent bonds, you know. Um, will not break in that temperature. So your DNA, your DNA won't break in half like this, but because these are hydrogen bonds, those will just fall off. Yeah. There's a lot, ton of applications for PCR, and this is something that like we, I do in the, all the time, thinking about my research. Um, a little bit of my work, I, I study how cells feel, feel forces. Um, just like how you guys, if you guys, when we used to take the train when it was really busy, you know, there's not as packed anymore on trains, but when it needs to, you can tell it's really crowded because um, you don't need to see your, you don't need to see that it's crowded. You can feel how everyone's bumping into you. Cells can also feel do the same thing. They don't need eyes. They don't have eyes, and they can feel how crowded it is. Um, and um, we're interested in understanding how do cells feel forces or feel each other. Anyways, um, but yeah, I do this. I use PCR in my in my experiments all the time, and it's really helpful for genetic engineering, like people are talking about. Um, and you know something that people talk about a lot is CRISPR. Maybe you guys have heard about CRISPR a lot nowadays. Um, and you know if you want to create thing, if you want to you know genetic create CRISPR constructs or things that you can CRISPR things in and out of, you need to use some a bit of PCR to engineer um, the CRISPR gene to do exactly what you want to do. Um, hopefully, all this you know made sense so far. If anyone has any other questions. Um, did it make sense? That was it, you guys can be honest because I'm always happy to take feedback and make things more clear um, how PCR works, and you guys get to see how it all happened in sort of a cooking method, where like a cook show, where I kind of show things pre-done and, and post-done. Um, thank you. Um, and yeah, there's something that we run all the time. Um, and if you guys ever work in a lab, at least work in a biology lab, you definitely get the chance to play with um, PCR or um, and do so like that. Yeah, it's cool that you guys get to see it um, in high school. I've no, actually never learned PCR or learned uh, or learned about it until I went to undergrad. Um, I actually did it myself. Um, so, yep. Any other questions about PCR or applications? There's so much you can do with it. And um, like, like, like someone mentioned about a really good point, beat it, you know, beat, uh, beat the point before I got to say it, is that it's really, that we use this for, for COVID-19 PCR testing. And it's um, really important for making, this is how we keep our case numbers or keep, keep each other safe is knowing the case number, uh, the cases around us, right? So um, yeah, there are all sorts of applications for PCR um, and yeah. 
and as and I'm glad you guys are as more excited about it than uh, so so excited about it because as someone who does it all the time, it feels like it's something that you have to do in the morning like a chore. Um, but there are days where it's exciting, like you see your, you see the gel and you see how it works. All right, you have one more minute. I'm gonna try and light one more time, and you guys might be able to see how far it's gone because I think it turned off. It automatically turns off to like save energy and stuff. Hi everyone, I'm Desan Davis with Rocky DU. Um, I work with Donovan um, and uh, just wanted to jump in while he was turning this back on um, to thank you all for participating in um, this session today, but to let you know that Rocky DU also has lots more opportunities for you to engage with Rockefeller University if you liked what you saw today. And so particularly we have the Lab Jumpstart program, which is currently accepting nominations and applications for a research program that will start in March after school um, where you would learn basic techniques, possibly just like PCR in more depth and a lot more things like that. And then over the summer, you'll spend seven weeks working with scientists doing a research project. And that'll all be from home. The whole entire program this year is from home, but we are still connecting with scientists to make sure that we can mail you kits or set up software on your computer so that you can do research with scientists this year, even though um, so much of our lives are virtual. Um, so please check that out. Um, the Jumpstart program requires a nomination, but you can just ask your teacher and uh, he can help you out with that. Um, and we can get you more information um, about that and a whole bunch of other things that we're doing. Um, so just wanted to thank you all for checking this out and you can go to uh, our website if you wanna learn more, I'll pop it right in the chat. All right, Donovan, back to you. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, that's yeah, super important. Um, definitely check out Jumpstart if you can. It's really fun. Um, I did it as an undergrad, not through Jumpstart, but through a different undergrad program, and it's such an immersive experience to get to um, um, at least you know at the time work in a lab or even just get to do experiments at home and like learn the process. It's it's really really insightful. Um, I, have, I have nothing else to really talk about today. I'm really glad you guys got to see see with PCR and see how it works. You can actually see. Now, within those 15, 20 minutes, all that stuff has ran out, right? The top left, I know it's, it's, it's sideways, but the top left is, is a ruler. So um, I always need to have a ruler to know how big a fragment is. These are like known white, no, known sizes. And then the bottom right, it's actually my, my experiment. I need to take out that fragment later today after you guys finish up this class. So um, so yeah, this is so exactly Did it work, Donovan? I, it did, I did. I got, I got exactly what I needed. I can go back to doing more cloning. So thank God. Um, but yeah. I'm glad you guys got to see it and are excited about it. And you know, if you guys want to run PCRs, you can always run my PCRs. <laughs> cool. I'm glad it was fun um, virtually. I wish I, I could could make it more interactive or make it you know make, have you guys see it, um, but. We used to do it, and this is a program that we used to do, like, uh, DeSan would run through, there's something called Lab lab Experiences, where you guys actually came in to do PCR, and we used, like, the DNA from your, um, from your cheek cells. We would swab your cheek cells and look at um, mitochondria uh, uh, DNA, basically. I know, I know, I wish you could see it in your life, too. This is, this is as much, a, this is as close I could, as I can get it to for you um, over Zoom. As virtual as it gets even i'm trying to even live stream it you see how it's moving right there it's, it's live it's as live as it gets i don't normally even look at it until the very end so this is um this is something <laughs> yeah thanks for inviting us guys uh you guys did a great job and uh, i don't know if you could tell by posts in the chat but they were really excited about the presentation and i'm sure i'll get nothing but positive feedback later <laughs> on today Bye guys, have a good holiday. Bye, Bye guys. Take care. Bye guys.